going to dive into the new 2D features of Unity. And at the same time, we're going to do a brief overview of the Character Controller 2D, which is uh, freely available on GitHub under the user Prime31. It's basically a, a character controller replacement for the one that uh, Unity uh, includes, except it's 2D only. It has a similar API where it has a move function and you pass in uh, a delta movement. But uh, we'll get to that later. So first thing we want to do is uh, we need some actual, we need an image to work with. So I'm going to drag the Spelunky Animations image in here. And the Spelunky Animations image is uh, directly from the demo scene. And obviously you can't use this in any commercial games. This is uh, just a, a sprite sheet that I found on the internet. So let's take a look at it. And we can see it's a sprite sheet with a bunch of different animations in it. So first thing we need to do is tell Unity that it's a sprite sheet, because Unity thinks that it is a single sprite by default. So we're going to change that to multiple, change this to true color, and apply. Okay, so we can now open up the sprite editor. So this is the Unity sprite editor. You can slice the sprite a few different ways. You can make your own slices manually, quite a tedious process, or you can use the automatic slicer. And the automatic slicer is nice if you have uh, objects of uh, all different sizes and shapes. So you can see how it just uses the alpha of the, the image to figure out where to dice it up. In this particular case, we don't want to do that because we have uh, a nice little sprite sheet here that is laid out in a grid. So we want to go ahead and change this to grid. And this sprite sheet has an 80 pixel by 80 pixel size. So we click slice and now we have our image sliced up nicely. You can see sometimes it gets some odd strays, but it doesn't really matter all that much. Um, now, normally you'd want to go through all these and name these something useful, but for our case, we're just going to leave them the way they are. So we don't want to name 60 or 70 images. I'm going to click Apply. And now Unity's got this Sprite Atlas here broken up into pieces for us. So we're going further, I just want to let you know there are some limitations to Unity's 2D system. You know, this is their first release, so they uh, they obviously don't have it, all the features they want in there. But uh, some of the stuff you, you really should be aware of before you decide to use it that you know pretty much are showstoppers, at least for me. There's no way to do multiple resolution atlases. So if you wanted to, for instance, have separate artwork for uh, you know SD versus HD, like Retina having one type of artwork or high density displays having one type and low density another. You have to use asset bundles, which are horrible on mobile. I won't even go into that. I mean, anybody who's used them will, will tell you. There's no way to swap the source sprite sheet at runtime. So, uh, you know, this, this animation is actually a great example of that. In the game Spelunky, there's, you know, 10 or 15 characters, and they all are just this exact same sprite sheet, just with a different sprite in there. So they can reuse all the animations that they made just by swiping, swapping out the backing texture. You can't do that in Unity at this time. So palette swaps and all that stuff, if you wanted to do that, you would have to recreate every single sprite and every single animation all by hand. And if you have you know, three, four, five, ten different enemies all with the same animations in Atlas, it's, it's tedious to say the least. Uh, the animation system is also uh, kind of limited for sprites. You there's no ping pong animation. Uh, in fact, you can't have an animation play backwards at all. You can only play forwards and pick a speed. That's pretty much it's pretty much it. There's uh, not much more to it. Okay. Now that we know those and those limitations, let's actually see some of the the neater features that the Unity crew's got in here. So we'll start off by uh, creating a run animation. So 13 through 20. This is our a run. Uh, sprites, so we just drag them over here, and what you see is uh, we've actually got an animation created for us. So we'll name it Run, stick it in the Animations folder, and Unity has created a few things for us. So we have a game object, and it's named Splunky Animations underscore 13. Let's just call that Player, and it's also created a sprite renderer and an animator, and the animator also has a an equally poor name, so let's call it player animator. So we open up the animator, 
and we get a mechanism state machine here, and it has our run animation. So that's all created for us. It's all ready to go. Now let's go back to our scene view, and let's create a couple more animations. So we're going to need a jump animation. We're just going to do, we're not going to go through all of these, we're just going to grab the basics. So jump 65 through 68. Now instead of dragging these into the scene, we're going to drag these onto our game object. Call that jump, go over in the animator, and sure enough we now have a jump animation. And I'm going to do the same thing for a fall animation, which is 69 to 72. Drag those onto our player, call it fall, stick it in animations. Uh, it's just going to move that animation up in there to its proper home. And uh, last thing I want to do is create an idle animation. This one is uh, a little bit different. We It's only one frame, so uh, what we need to do to tell Unity about this is just drag we need to have two objects selected when we drag it on here. So we'll call that idle. And now we have an idle animation. Now that idle animation has one extra frame. So if we push play, oh, our default animation is run, which we don't want. We actually want to change that over to idle. So let's set that as the default. And now let's push play and see what we get. Okay, so there's our idle animation. We can, uh, we can fix that by just opening the animation window. So this brings up the dope sheet here, and you can see that uh, we have all of our animations here. And uh, this is actually a, another one of the limitations. Like this animation editor is, is pretty horrible for actually working with on a regular basis. I mean, it, the sprites are too small, it's really hard to work with. It seems like they just tried to hack sprite animation into the, the animation window. And uh, it's just not very pleasant. The one nice thing about it is you can see your sprites if you're actually adding curves. Like uh, if you're adding, the, the animation window works great for all these other things, but with these and the curves in here matching up with your little sprites, it's it's pretty uh, pretty handy. But for actually making sprite animations, it's uh, it's pretty horrible. So we're just going to go in here and remove that and be done with it. So now our our idle animation is just one frame. Okay, that's all set. So we do want to go over here and just make one little change. Now we're not going to be using Mechanim. This isn't a Mechanim tutorial. So we're going to, when we, when we jump in here and start using these animations, we're going to skip all of Mechanim's awesome features. Like we're not going to use any parameters. Uh, we're, not going to, we're not going to use the state machine as a state machine really. The only, thing, the only transition we're even going to have in here is this one. So from jump to fall, we're adding a transition. And uh, sometimes it plays, sometimes it doesn't. Just uh, it's a little bug in 4.3. I haven't figured out what exactly triggers it, but under normal circumstances, you can push the play button and actually play this. But we'll just drag it and see. It goes from it's playing jump and then it plays fall. Let's see if that triggered it to work. Oh, right, this is the general gist of it. If you have a working install, that'll actually play for you. Not overly important at the moment, though. Okay, so uh, we are we have all of our animations set. We have our our player here all ready to go, so we can actually jump into the character controller 2D stuff. So first thing we need is something to stand on. We need a little level geometry to work with. So I'm going to stick a quad in here and just scale it. So we have something to run on. Uh, quad by default is going to get a mesh collider, which isn't much use to us because we're in the 2D world. So if we go in here and put a box collider on it, that'll be a little better. Okay, so now we have our box collider, we have our player, and we are ready to actually uh, jump into some code. So the first thing we'll do is we'll drag the character controller 2D script into our project. And that's really all you need for the character controller 2D system. It's just that one script. Now, next thing we want to do is there, there is an animation extensions file that comes with the character controller 2D. So I always um, add this to any project I'm working with. It's just a, a simple extension method. It's called go to state if not already there. And you know, quite simply, it just jumps to 
the state and mechanism and plays that animation if you're not already there. It's uh, it's quite handy, nice, easy, shorthand way to get to things. So next thing we need to do is actually create a player controller. So we'll jump in here and create an empty script. And this is going to be where we do all of our work. So the player controller, we'll stick that on our player. And we are ready to actually start scripting. OK, the first thing we want to do is uh, I'm just going to copy paste in some stuff here. So each of our animation states over here in the animator, and we want to be able to, to reference these at runtime. We want to be able to, to so that we can tell Mechanim to jump to and play those. So Mechanim does this via a, a hash. That's how it identifies each one. So we have uh, idle run and jump. And you can see uh, there's an animator.string to hash method that grabs that hash. And you know, it might look a little odd that we're doing base layer dot idle, but let's just go over here into the animator and we'll see why. You can see we have only a single layer and it's called base layer. So that means for Mechanim to identify any of these animations, it uses base layer and then dot idle, so the name up here. And if you had more layers, you would just uh, grab the, the layer, like layer name dot animation name. Okay, so now we have access to our hashes for idle run jump. We, uh, we're actually going to want to stick a couple little private variables in here. So in our awake method, we're going to want to get access to our character controller 2D and our animator. Those are the two components that are going to be uh, really important to this particular script. So let's paste those in. And we are all set. So let's just look at the controller API. So the character controller has... Uh, as a move method you know, that takes a delta movement, much like the character controller that comes with Unity for 3D. It has a is grounded, and something uh, has a collision state also, which is uh, very similar to the one that Unity uh, provides. And instead of uh, using reflection to call on controller collider hit, uh, we have on controller collided event that you can subscribe to. And that makes things a little bit quicker and easier. Okay, that's all we need to know for now. So let's go ahead and stick our update method in, and we'll go over what's in there. This is not gonna. This is gonna be a, a real simple controller. It's not gonna be. Uh, again, we're not using Mechanim to its fullest. In fact, we're really not using Mechanim uh, at all. Like all the, the awesome features of Mechanim, you really should check out some of the other tutorials uh, on the Learn site, for example, and check through the docs because. Mechanism is fantastic, but for this demo, we don't want to make this a mechanism tutorial. So the update method's here, and this is going to control all of our input and all of our animations, and it does it all in just a few lines. So first thing we're doing here is we are grabbing the velocity, the current velocity of the character controller, because we want to use that as our base. Uh, if we're grounded, we'll just reset the velocity of y to zero. And now for input, we'll just go over uh, the right arrow. So if we push the right arrow, we set the x direction velocity to run speed. We tell the character controller to go right, and or not the character controller. We tell the, we we call the go right method, which tells which faces the sprite to the right. And then uh, if we're grounded, we go to the run state if we're not already there. And we do the exact same thing for the left arrow. Only difference is we're swapping directions. And if there's no input, then we go to the idle state if we're grounded. So two methods that aren't in there yet are go left and go right. And let's get these in this. And it's real simple. All we're doing is changing the direction that the sprite is facing. So for changing the direction of a sprite, you just uh, basically flip the local scale in the x direction, and that changes horizontal direction. So all we're doing is checking to see if we're already facing left. And if we're not, we'll just uh, set that scale to negative so that we flip the sprite to the left. So going back over to our input handling, we have uh, up arrow is going to make us jump. So we set a target jump height and use the good old two times target jump height minus times the gravity to get our our uh, impulse velocity. And then we go to state if not already there again. We go to the jump state. And last but not least, we add gravity in. And then when we, uh, when we actually do the movement, we say controller.move. And to make this time scale independent, we're just going to multiply the velocity times time.delta time. So 
good old math of velocity times the time gives us a distance to move. So let's jump back into Unity over here and we can see we have a couple issues and that's that we have not defined our instance variables yet. No problem. We'll just go ahead and paste those in. So we're going to use a gravity of negative 15, a run speed of 8, jump back to Unity, and there we go. So let's push play and see what happens. Nothing. We have a null reference exception. Why is that? And that is because our controller.velocity, our, our uh, controller doesn't actually exist on our player yet. We didn't add it. So let's go ahead and add the controller. And you can see what we're going to get here is a box collider 2D and the character controller script. So the box collider is just going to use the sprites extents by default. And that's uh, it's a little too big. We don't really want it like that. So we're just going to scale that down a bit. Something like that will work. And then the last thing is we will want to add a rigid body 2D, a kinematic rigid body 2D that is. Okay, so now we can push play. And no more no refs, but our player just falls through everything. And that is uh, to be expected because there's one thing uh, we did not set up in here yet. And that's our, our layer mask. So the character controller needs to know which layer is the ground. So it's called the platform mask. So we'll set that to default. And now it's important that since we've set the platform mask to default, we actually want to make sure that our player is on a different layer. Okay, so our player is on the player level. Our quad's on the default level. So now we can push play. You can see we have a player running around and it looks like he's shooting out a bunch of rays. So what those are is just some uh, some debug rays and the character controller by default will have the debug defined and all this is doing is basically there's a method in here debug.drawaway and it's it's there to let you see like how many rays the character controller is sending out where they are so you can see uh, there's quite a few and I'm just gonna pause it here you can see there's quite a few in the horizontal direction and you can configure all this in the character controller so right here we have uh, we have our total horizontal rays and total vertical rays and in the horizontal direction you can set that to whatever you want you know if you want to if you're gonna have a really fine-grained level geometry you want to do a lot more if you have something a little bit more coarse you can drop that down to something like four and three usually works pretty good and you can see the rays right there because we have the debug defined so if we up up here we can comment that out and now we'll have no more rays so last thing I want to show you here is uh, how to set up a one-way platform and uh, this is pretty easy so we're just gonna well, actually we'll just duplicate this quad Call it one way, move it up, scale it down. Okay, so there's our one-way platform. Now, what we need to do to set this up uh, so that the character controller 2D knows what to do with it is get rid of this box collider. We're going to want to add an edge collider. And by default, Unity puts it in the middle of your geometry, which isn't really what we want. So if you hold down shift, you can actually move these verts up. So we'll just move each one up a hair. So there we go. So now we have an edge collider on here. And the only thing left to do is to change this so that it's on the one-way platform mask. And you can see there's a one-way platform mask here. So anything that's on the one-way platform mask should be uh, edge collider. That way the character controller 2D can actually allow you to jump up through it. And there you have it. That is a quick overview of 2D for Unity and also uh, basically getting started with the character controller 2D. Thanks for watching.